And this is the Stella Culinary School podcast found online at StellaCulinary.com. My name is Jacob Burton. Thank you once again for uh, joining me. Uh, we're going live here in the newish studio setup. I just got a bunch of uh, different equipment going on. And uh, I was placing together the last little bits late last night. So all the bells and whistles are uh, still yet to be introduced uh, into this live stream, which just continues to evolve uh, each and uh, every day. And I will be completely honest. I am going to be leaning on the uh, live crowd a little bit more this morning for their questions and comments. We're going to be a little bit loosey-goosey. Uh, normally, I have a whole sheet prepared full of notes. Uh, as you can see here, it's blank. So... Yeah, we're, uh, I got some some topics to talk about, uh, some chef tests and things like that. I also have your original comments um, in the uh, actual uh, live feed announcement themselves that, uh, that we'll be going through a little bit. But uh, you can also hear me on, on Clubhouse. And so right now I started a, uh, a live room on Clubhouse. And the idea is uh, with this new app, I know it's only for the iPhone right now. Uh, hopefully they'll roll that out a little bit wider. But what I like about the Clubhouse app is you're able to uh, just put your headphones in uh, and listen on the go. So you don't have to have the app open. It's like a podcasting app. So you can listen to the podcast live via Clubhouse. Um, and then you can uh, raise your hand and ask a question if I click on you. Um, you should be able to uh, speak to me just like a phone call, uh, and you would be able to um, interact with me uh, that way. So it kind of adds that live uh, listener component. And as more people join, then you can have a few different people uh, on the conversation as well. Now, one of the questions uh, that we got earlier on in the week in the Facebook group, and the, the group is just growing faster and faster uh, each day. So we're getting... Um, a lot of comments. So I'm trying to uh, scroll through here, but we're a uh, a bit, as you can see, I'm a bit buried here uh, on th on this. But there was a uh, a gentleman that was trying out. That's nice. A gentleman that was trying out for a kitchen manager position at a uh, local grocery store. I'm trying to, f to scroll through and, and find this post here. And it was very, um, the, the timing was great on this because one of the topics I want to talk to about anyways is the, um, the chef tryout situation in general, right? Because I just had a, uh, I just hired a banquet chef uh, for the hotel that I run. And the, uh, the banquet chef, uh, one of the things that they have to do uh, during the interview process is they have to uh, come and try out, right? So um, one of the things that I really hate about the whole interview process as a chef is the actual tryout process. And the reason being is I just... It, it always turns into this this weird thing, right, where, you know, you go in, you, you do, I mean, so let me back up. When I was doing a uh, an interview a few years back, um, right after I left Stella, I was going around uh, doing some consulting, and there was a guy who had uh, made some money in tech and wanted to open up a restaurant in the Bay Area. And I went down, we had a good interview and had a couple of uh, solid subsequent chats. And he wanted me to come back and, and do a tasting for him. And the tasting consisted of, you know, going to his mansion and uh, and cooking for him and, and, and 13 of his uh, friends who he was calling in investors. And I'm like, man, that's not a tasting, that's... <laughs> that's an unpaid private party. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and pass on that, right? And uh, and the thing about a, a, a tasting is this. M most restaurant tours in general, okay, and this is probably going to piss off some restaurant tours out there, but most restaurant tours in general, 
um, unless they came from a kitchen background, aren't really qualified to hire a chef. They just aren't, right? Um, uh, and and because of that, they they default on well, let's just go ahead and you know let's have this guy do a tasting. If this if uh, you know this person can do a, a a good solid tasting for us and cook good food, well then you know obviously they're going to get the job. The problem with that is, is I have line cooks that could come into your house and cook for four people and blow your mind. Are they ready to be your executive chef? Absolutely not. Right. So the whole thing that you're doing for a when you're looking for that position is you're looking for somebody who can lead your team. Right. So why would I then if I hate tasting so much, why would I uh, ask somebody to come in and, and do a tasting? Well, because my approach is a little bit different. First of all, I don't do the whole uh, market basket bullshit, right? I'm not trying to recreate some episode of Chopped uh, in my kitchen. I'm not going to try and have this person run around my my kitchen uh, all crazy like a chick with her head cut off, right? It's just not my my style. But what I want to do is I want to have this person come in and I want to get a sense for where their head is at. And I want to see if they have uh, basic flavor structures and flavor profiles nailed along with execution te- and technique. So, for example, in this uh, interview I was doing for this banquet chef, one of the things I'm looking for, so this person had a background in high volume and also fine dining, right? So they could probably do some nice high-end um, you know, tasting menu style plates. Um, and they could also do, um, you know, uh, presumably based on their resume and where they've been, a banquet menu for, you know, 400, 500, 600 people, which is exactly uh, what I need, right? So one of the first things I'm looking at is, is this person trying to uh, impress me and, and give me these, uh, you know, these crazy dishes that look beautiful and have a lot of different touch points to it and are complex to show off their actual culinary skill? Or... Are they simply just, um, or are, are they being true to the job at hand that they're uh, applying for and giving me dishes that they could execute? And that was the first thing I was looking for. So as this gentleman was cooking for me, I'm looking at his dishes uh, and, and thinking to myself, well, would this be appropriate for our banquet department? Would this work within our banquet department? Could we execute this for 300 people? And when he would bring me a, a dish, uh, he would, you know, I, I, would, I would ask him, hey, so cool, you have this dish here. How would you execute this dish for, you know, 250, 300? And I have him walk me through, just like in, in previous podcasts, how we visualize our execution. We're talking about how we actually execute a dish, right? I would have him walk me through how this dish in his mind uh, would be executed and, and kind of, you know, think to myself, well, does that make sense? Uh, would that be uh, something that we could do? And to his credit, I mean, he would uh, walk me through in in, uh, in good fashion, right? It would all make sense, uh, which is um, why he got the job. Okay, so number one, it's very important to make sure that you're cooking for the, the job that you actually want. Okay, so if you go in, so the the person who, and I'm, Forgive me if if somebody wants to help me out and drop me a link in the comments. I'm scrolling through our Facebook thing, and the, Facebook has this weird way of basically telling me um, what order I should view the content in. Uh, so if you want to, if you click on the timestamp, if you happen to find that post, and then just copy that uh, URL into the uh, actual uh, comment section and post it for me, then uh, I can review his post because I'm kind of forgetting some of the details, but I know it was at something equivalent of a grocery store um, and a kitchen manager position. So I'm assuming it's sort of one of those high end stores, kind of like a Whole Foods where you would, uh, you know, create uh, bulk items for uh, salad and maybe like some to go items um, that you have. They might have like a deli pickup section. So for that, you want to show them, number one, that you understand great flavor structure. Right. So, um, you know, following your F step process, making sure that your meat is seasoned properly, making sure that you're using appropriate technique. But all of that stuff is a given. OK, 
Okay. Again, when you're at the level of applying for a kitchen manager position, right, a leadership role in a kitchen, then the assumption is you can cook, right? You should be able to come to my house or I should be able to come to your house and you should be able to cook me a great meal, right? I mean, that's kind of just a, a, a given. But that's not what we're looking for as hiring managers, right? What we're looking for is how do you work within that kitchen? How does your food and style um, equate with what we're doing? Um, and do you understand what it is you're actually looking for? Are you coming in and trying to cook me a bunch of classic French bistro dishes uh, when really I need a guy who can make me a killer pasta salad, right? And if that's the case, then make me a killer pasta salad. Make me, uh, you know, something that's going to, um, that I can visualize and be like, you know what, this is going to bring my regulars back time and time again, and it's going to make me some money. Oh, thank you, Jordan. I just got a, um, Jordan, you are the man. He just dropped a link for me here. Oops. So what I want to do is actually back up real quick. We'll go ahead and open this in a new tab. And so, okay, so it was Nick, and Nick says, um, we'll go ahead and pull this up like this. So Nick says, uh, have a chef's practical test for a job I'm really hoping for next week. They told me I need to make a, a chicken, a beef, and a pork. I'm thinking grilled strip steak with roasted carrot puree, caramelized onions, uh, and grilled asparagus, balsamic grilled chicken, top of bruschetta over Parmesan polenta, uh, gorgonzola stuff, pork chop with garlic, smashed fingers, and potatoes. Uh, all sound great, by the way. Uh, thoughts and opinions are welcome. So here's here's the thing, um, and before we kind of dive into the the comments uh, a little bit more, is all that sounds good, right? R writing a menu and executing a menu are two different things. And, and Jordan, I know you asked a question on that and we'll see if we can, uh, uh, get back to that. In fact, if you want to go ahead and repost that question in the live comments, um, so I don't have to scroll again. Um, I'll, I'll address that here in a second, but the, what you wrote, right? So grilled, uh, you know, grilled strip steak, roasted carrot puree, caramelized onions and grilled asparagus. Yeah. Sounds great. Right. I mean, does that sound like a solid steak dish to you? Sounds great to me. Um, it's all about execution. So is your puree creamy? Is it uh, uh, the uh, pro proper consistency? Did you add in some butter uh, and emulsify it properly? Your, your, your oil, is your flavor structure on point? Are you following uh, that flavor structure? Uh, with your, your chicken, is it, you know, when you grilled it, did you actually marinate that chicken first, All right? Did you give it some flavor? Um, and, and again, it, what are they looking for? Are they looking to see if you can actually uh, nail these techniques or um, are they looking for you to uh, give them something that they could do on a, on a mass produced scale? So, you know, I, I ask him that, you know, when he asked this question uh, originally, I asked Nick, I say, hey, you know, it's uh, kind of hard to, uh, without knowing the position you're going for uh, and the style of the restaurant, you know, and he said, it's, well, it's a local grocery market chain, uh, but they have an insane deli fresh made foods program. Um, and I won't uh, say the name only because I don't know if he wants me to talk about the the actual details uh, live on the podcast. But for something like that, it's also okay too to, to ask a clarifying statement. You know, when, so when they, when you go through the, the whole interview process and they say, Hey, we want you to come in. We want you to cook these dishes for us. My next question would be, do you want this to be something that shows off my skill and technique and my ability to execute something like an entree style dish, or are you looking for me to produce dishes that you might want to put on your menu? All right. Cause also too, how much, how much say and how much involvement does the kitchen manager have, um, in, uh, in, in this, in this area, do you have a, uh, do you have a chef above you? Are they looking for you to be creative? Are they looking for you to create new, uh, new and separate dishes? Right. So those are all the things that, that you want to ask. So when you go in, you want to make sure that you have um, your mise en place set and ready to execute. And they're also looking that you can uh, create and execute a dish on a timely fashion, right? Or in a timely fashion, I should say. Uh, 
Now, one of the things that I uh, I do as well is I'll always make my chef try out. I'll always put them kind of in a in a situation. Now, again, I'm not trying to do some bullshit chopped challenge for them, okay? Um, but I will put them in a situation um, that isn't ideal. So in, in this case, so we have a large uh, banquet space downstairs, like a massive banquet kitchen in the basement. And this is where this gentleman will be cooking and executing his banquets. But for his tryout, I stuck him up in the, um, in the main restaurant kitchen. And I said, hey, all the ingredients are up here. I want you to cook up here. Um, and uh, you can, you know, hop on the hotline if you need to sear something or if you need to grill something. And this is all during, you know, our, our morning service into our lunch service. So I had him come at 10 a.m. Um, and, and I told him to have the food ready somewhere around uh, 1 p.m., right? Now, what's nice about this is it forces him to hop up on the line around my cooks that I already know and trust and have hired and trained, right, and have him interact with these cooks, right? And that's way more important to me than how uh, any of these, these dishes end up actually tasting, Right. Uh, because the if if you have a good attitude and you have a good appeal, right? I mean, I want a certain base level of skill. Right. The the banquet chef position on our property is basically an executive chef position. Right. You're overseeing about two and a half, three million dollars in revenue, which is the size of, you know, a, a medium ish, uh, you know, restaurant sort of thing. So at, at that level of revenue, um, you know, you're basically an executive chef of a single outlet and you're being paid as such, right? So I expect to have that skill level, but also too, because of my background and because I, you know, I normally train people and, and, and grow them from the inside out. I not concerned about technical flaws, right? As long as there's not a ton, right? There's always going to be a little bit here and there. There's always going to be some personal preferences. I might want to have this person change, but I'm not really ever concerned about, um, you know, small little technical flaws because I can train that out of them. What I can't train out of them is their attitude and how I interact with my crew, right? So if they come in, they have a good interview and, and they're just slapping hands and, you know, being all, you know, fun and games with, with the big dog, right? With a chef. And then they're not calm behind on the line. They're not having, they just have good kitchen etiquette. Um, I remember when I was a, um, uh, an intern at a, a French restaurant in San Francisco, and I was low man on the totem pole, right? I was just banging prep in the back and, uh, you know, working garmanger shifts and things like that. And they had this lead line cook tryout come in, and he was speaking fr French to the chef and, you know, bullshitting with the sous chef and, you know, but all day long he was just brutalizing the interns in the back, just being a complete prick. And, uh, hey, commie, hey, commie, hey, commie, right? You know, you have the, the, the commis, which is the, um, you know, what you basically call an entry-level cook in a French kitchen. And he would just be barking at us all day long. I mean, a total prick. And 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 this was a rough kitchen, right? But it just also, too, you got to earn your spot. It's like, I'll, I'll take my beating from the sous chef over here, right? Because he's the man. He's the guy who, who runs this place. Uh, you know, he's the guy who earned the stars. You're just some bullshit line cook coming in treating me like shit, right? At the end of the day, the sous chef, um, who's a, who was never really too concerned in my opinion or the opinion of, of the interns, which he probably really shouldn't be, to be honest with you, he asked us. He said, uh, "Hey, how you know? What do you guys think of the line cook?" We're like, "What do you mean? What do we think? Well, what do you think? Did you like him?" We're like, "Well, honestly, chef, we thought he was kind of a prick." And he's like, "Okay, well, cool. We won't hire him then. You know, I, I was going to hire him. I thought his technique was good, but you know." If he's here on his first day treating you guys like pricks or, or, or being a prick to you guys, um, then that's just going to cause problems, okay? And that's a lesson that I took with me for a long time, all right? Because it's not, obviously, it's not just skill um, that you're you're looking for. It's how are they going to mesh with your crew? Now, this is universal for all sort of uh, business and corporate environments, right? But it's way more important um, in a kitchen than in most environments where you're just you're forced into the situations where you're standing next to this person uh, for long periods of time uh, working a, a a long shift right uh, shoulder to shoulder in a stressful hot environment 
Uh, and if you can't interact with each other properly, uh, then it's it's gonna it's gonna be bad news, right? You're gonna have some flare ups. You're gonna have some anger issues. You're gonna have some egos uh, getting hurt, and it's gonna turn into a, a a a bad deal for all involved. So, Nick, to recap, uh, when if they're having you try out, or just anyone who's trying out for a a, a position, um. Know that it's more about how you interact with the environment than anything, right? And then cook what's appropriate for the restaurant, all right? I know I know that seems obvious, but I can't tell you how many people, they, they miss this step, right? They miss this step because they do not cook what's appropriate. They want to come in and they want to show everybody what... Uh, they can do at their peak, right? So they're just more concerned with doing a killer seven course tasting menu um, that they think would be at home in a, you know, two or three star Michelin restaurant when they're being hired as a chef de cuisine for a steakhouse, right? Um, or they're being hired as a kitchen manager for a high end grocery chain. So cause that's not always translatable either, right? Just because you were killing it as a, uh, you know, as a lead line or a sous chef at a Michelin starred restaurant doesn't necessarily mean that you'd be a great fit for my, uh, you know, more casual dining environment in my local restaurant, right? So I want to see that you can groove in that situation. If you come into to my local, uh, my local deli station and you start trying to run it like it's a Michelin restaurant, right? You're going to quickly blow my labor budget. You're going to, you know, screw with my local clientele who's like, what the hell is with this $30 a pound lobster salad? I mean, who knows? Maybe they like it, right? And that's why you can, you want to ease your way in. You want to first get with their program, show them that you can cook their style of food. You can execute uh, what they want and what they're hiring you for. Right. And then once you get in there and you and you start to build trust, not only with with the ownership and your management, but also the clientele, then some of that stuff does become transferable. Right. You can then take your. Your skill set that you learn in your fine dining, in your upscale uh, environments, and you can translate that to a more casual environment. Right. Now, an interesting comment that I had and forgive me, I, I, I read all your comments throughout the weeks. Um, or throughout the week uh, between the podcast. Uh, so I forget who um, exactly said it. But one of the interesting comments, when because in last episode, if you remember, we were talking about, you know, when you're starting your culinary career, starting in the, you know, a high-end kitchen, because it's always easy to take a step down. It's much more difficult uh, to take that step up after a long time, especially if you're not willing to sacrifice pay, right? If you want to, you know, work your way up in, you know, casual dining for 15 years and become a, you know, a salary kitchen manager or, or a salary chef, and then, you know, drop back down to an hourly position in fine dining and work your way back up and, you know, more power to you. But there comes a certain point where you have your career established and your life established. And so it's hard to take that step back. And, one of the people uh, commented saying, hey, you know, yeah, I, I agree uh, that it's that it's in, important uh, to work in a high-end kitchen, but sometimes I feel like it's not beneficial for people to work in two or three Mission Star kitchens um, as career growth because it's, it's, so, it's such specialized work that they're spending so much time on you know singular tasks, and they're not learning a, a, a broad uh, width of information. And to a certain extent, I I agree with that. Now, if for me, I think the best thing for a young cook, the best kitchen for a young cook to get into, is a as a one Michelin star kitchen or the equivalent, right? But you don't because you don't have a Michelin guide everywhere. But at a one Michelin star restaurant, you're doing. Uh, upscale, nice food, clean plates, great flavor structure, solid on point technique. But the food isn't so complex that you need a massive army of cooks uh, to produce this, right? You're, so 
in the two and three mission star levels, I mean, those kitchens have anywhere from, you know, 30 to 60 cooks, sometimes even more. And they're all uh, highly specialized. Now, if you work your way up to the top, right, if you're in a two or three mission star kitchen and, uh, and, and you're a sous chef or a chef de partie, right, or a, um, uh, a, like a chef de cuisine, right, and you're coming from like the laundry or Alinea or, you know, any n- number of those two or three mission star restaurants, uh, you're a total badass, right? You're going to be absolutely well-rounded. Uh, but it probably took you a, a long time to kind of climb your way uh, through those ranks if you started off uh, at the very bottom uh, of the kitchen, right? In a one Michelin star environment, they're going to have a smaller staff, so you're going to get thrown into more places. You're going to have more exposure uh, to more technique and to more uh, food, right? Uh, you know, there's this, this joke where it's like, uh, oh, you know, this... <clears throat> Yeah, this guy came from the, from the laundry. Um, you know, he can't really cook anything. But if you need him to tourne carrots, right, he can do fifty pounds in you know an hour. So, because when you start off at a at a in, again in a two or three mission star restaurant, a lot of the times the the lowest guys on the ladder, they're just kind of stuck in the back doing singular repetitive tasks and just busting those out right one after the other, and that gets you really good at high end efficient prep. Um, but in the real world. You know, for the most part, people aren't, you know, tourneying vegetables or doing all these fancy little uh, cuts for uh, garnishes. And those things are good to know and good to be exposed to. But a lot of that stuff you get exposed to in a much more practical way um, in a uh, in, in a one Michelin star or like a, a semi fine dining uh, environment. So that would be uh, my recommendation. Anyone who's starting out in the industry, a young cook who, or just young in your career, right. Uh, who wants to be a chef is go find a, a, a good, a high end restaurant that doesn't have a massive kitchen crew, right. That maybe, uh, uh, on the line, uh, or in the kitchen total, they have, you know, maximum 10 to 15 people. Cause that's going to get you the, the most exposure. And really in, in these, uh, you know, um, in a lot of towns, you find these total gems that are chef owned and operated, and the chef is there every single night. It's their, you know, it's their sole restaurant, and you want to catch these guys on their upswing, right? Because you know every great restaurant empire usually starts with one um, chef owned and operated restaurant, especially if it's a you know fine dining or upscale, and so you want to search out this the chef who is there you know, five, six, seven nights a week, uh, building his, his restaurant and his, uh, empire, uh, because they're going to be there in the shits day in day out. And you're going to be able to get a lot of attention from this person. And if you turn out to be one of their key individuals, if you show them that you can hang and bang, uh, through all the stress and through all the hardship, uh, then when they inevitably expand, right. Uh, you're going to be coming up the line with them. All right. So that's a, a really good way to leapfrog in your career is by finding that, that standalone restaurant, that chef owned and operated. You got some chef who's just, you know, cooking their heart out and you kind of ride their coattails up the ladder. Right. And you see, I mean, that's what a lot of guys did at the, uh, I mean, there's like the whole French laundry army, right. That, you know, back in the early days in the, you know, uh, early to mid nineties in, uh, Yauntville, you had, uh, you know, Ron Siegel and, um, oh my God, Grant Ackett's right. All these guys who started off early with Thomas Keller when Keller was still in the kitchen cooking. And, uh, all these guys went on to, you know, uh, become, you know, world famous chefs in their in their own right, right? Because they're able to uh, ride the wave up, and that's not to say that the guys in in Keller's kitchens now aren't also doing that. Um, but there's just there's this magical point in time where you have a uh, a small uh, chef ran operation, um, and if you get in there, that's going to be your most impactful learning environment. And every city, every town, right, has a handful of those restaurants. Um, where they have that that chef who's just there uh, cooking their heart out. They're probably a bit of a maniac, right? Because they're uh, under stress, they just dropped or they're overstressed. They just dropped their life savings into this restaurant, um, and they're going to, you know, um, they're going to be tough to work with, right? But if you can put up with that, if you can work your way through that that stressful environment, um, then you're going to get that the most impactful learning 
experience possible. And that's what that's what the whole point of this is, right? Is it's where are you going to get the most ROI on your time investment? You're going into a restaurant to learn, to to grow your career, where are you going to get the best ROI? And that ROI, the best time spent early on in your career, is going to be for a upscale, roughly one Michelin star equivalent restaurant with a, 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 a head chef that is uh, trying to build their career and, and build their name, right? Who's there on the line um, for, you know, um, most of the time, right? So you can kind of... Uh, get all and just kind of soak up like a sponge all their knowledge. All right, let's review some of your comments here. Um, under the best of circumstances, how good can the food be for a banquet relative to a good restaurant meal? Um, under the best of circumstances, under well uh, executed uh, circumstances, it can be great. Right. The thing is, is, is you have to be able to um, you have to cook to the audience and you have to execute well. Now, by implementing uh, modern technology uh, like the combi ovens, which we've discussed in uh, previous episodes, uh, for holding your, your meats and your um, other sides at a precise temperature so they don't overcook or undercook, right, and having a good execution workflow, you can produce some great, great meals, right? But what you have to think about um, constantly and what we talk about um, a lot in banquets but also just in restaurant execution in general is moves to the plate. Right? How many moves do you have to make on that plate to get that plate from empty to complete and to the guest? Right, And for a, a banquet, you really want no more than five moves. Right, So, for example, um, a plate's coming down the, the line, and sometimes like in larger banquet uh, operations, you'll have a conveyor belt set up. Right, uh, Other times, you just have like a long table, and they're passing plates down. And the way that this normally works, right, is so on, you know, if we're plating left to right, so on the left-hand side of me, I have some warming cabinets that have um, warm plates in them and also all of my, my hot food, right? If they're a combi oven, then more power to you, even, even better, okay? And then, well, with the combi ovens, you can pre-plate, but, you know, we won't get into that. We'll talk about that later, possibly. So what you have is you have your proteins, your sides, all that sort of stuff, and then what you do is you lay out your ingredients, you know, enough to do, you know, maybe 10 to 15 minutes worth of plating hot on that table, right? And you have your backups and your warming cabinets. So the lead guy or the, or the, the guy at the head of the table grabs all the plates or grabs a nice stack of hot plates uh, out of the, the warming cabinet, drops them on the left-hand side, right? Then you drop the sides in front of each person. The sauce goes at the end, usually where the head chef is standing, and the banquet manager or banquet captain, okay? So let's say we're doing some, uh, you know, a pan-roasted filet mignon with a, uh, you know, garlic mashed potatoes, glazed carrots, and thyme wine uh, demi-glace, all of which are, are um, you know, very appropriate for a banquet, right? High-end, delicious dish, but very simple and straightforward to execute. So glazed root vegetables like a carrot is great because they hold their temp right mashed potatoes easy to hold their temp nice and creamy okay the steak you can hold at the precise temperature um, or a lot of times too what you're doing is you're uh, searing the steaks um, you know rare you fire them in the oven day of and then you hold them in your warming cabinet you get to know your warming cabinet to where you're hitting that you know dead on like mid-rare medium-ish temperature all right so first guy Mashed potatoes on the plate, slides it down. The carrot guy put the, puts the carrots on. Steak guy puts the steak on. The chef sauces, right? And that's four moves, okay? Then either the chef or the another cook or banquet manager will then wipe the plate, cap it, and then send it. Now, in larger banquet environments where you're doing a plate for, say, like 300 people, they go back into a warming cabinet stacked up so you have the the plate lids that you can stack and they go back into that warming environment um you know and held for a few minutes probably 10 15 minutes so what you want to do is you want to get ahead on that execution because when those plates start going they go really really fast right and then if you're doing a really big banquet you want a, a double-sided line where you're basically doing the exact same thing but you got plates coming down from both lines so instead of having four people you have eight people plating okay so what happens a lot of times is number one, people with banquets, it's all about timing. 
people just suck with their timing. It's it's a learned skill set. So there's a a, a, tr- a real true skill in being able to cook food and time it properly to where it's not going to overcook. It's not going to be underdone, and it comes out warm. Uh, on a plate and ready to rock, but still 15 minutes early and held at the appropriate temperature so that way it could be brought out in a timely fashion, all right? So because you have all these different timing variables with banquets, it's not, uh, that's why banquet food in general just isn't that good, right? Because it takes somebody who really knows what they're doing. And unfortunately, and this might offend some of my my friends and banquets out there, but they know it to be true. Unfortunately, a lot of the rock star cooks and a lot of the rock star chefs uh, don't gravitate towards banquets, right? They want to be uh, on a hotline in a fine dining environment, doing fancy garnishes and saucing plates and, you know, doing all of that stuff. But there's definitely a demand for talent in banquets, which is why if you're a talented banquet chef that can ac- execute large parties, you get paid very well, right? That's, that's a, that's a well, paying job and it's a it's a great career path for uh you know any uh young cook who's looking to to up their game and and to make some serious money but because of that you get a bunch of people who are just you know they get bad habits and they you know they you don't do a whole lot of um you know in a lot of banquet programs unfortunately you don't do a whole lot of scratch cooking so they're just opening cans and ripping open bags and dropping you know frozen items into a fryer so they just never have an opportunity if they come up through that banqueting system to, to learn really great technique and high level food. Conversely though, what happens is you get these hot shot fine dining cooks who, who look at the slop that's being served in, in a, a banquet department and they go, Oh dude, look at these hacks. I could, I could totally, I could totally outcook them. Right. I'm, I'm going to go and I'm going to, you know, uh, I'm going to go down there. I'm going to be a banquet chef or be the banquet sous chef. And I'm going to show these guys what's up. And then they do their first party of 300 and you find them in the corner of a walk and crying, right? They're just getting absolutely crushed. It's completely different, right? But what's universal is execution, which we constantly talk about, right? So if you get good at execution, uh, then that execution workflow translates to fine dining and it translates uh, also to banquets as well. The most important thing that you can do, right, which professional chefs, um, not to mention home cooks, but professional chefs continually um, screw up on is they don't visualize their execution. And you've seen in past podcasts when we talk about execution, they're not actually visualizing their execution. What you want to do is you want to, from start to finish, right? Even when you write your menu, you start thinking about how long are certain things going to take me to prep. Uh, can I get this all prepped in time? Can I get, get my mise en place even set? Then what are my fire times looking like? If I want to get 300 steaks seared and my flat top is X big, say it's uh, you know 24 by 36, how long is it going to take you to sear 300 steaks uh, on your flat top? I don't know. Do you know? Do you know? I mean, you should know. You're the banquet chef, right? So then if you're, I mean, obviously you're going to have to do them batches, right? So how many batches is it? How many sheet trays is it? How many sheet trays do you need to have, right? Then what's your oven space like? Can you fire all those steaks at once or do you have to fire those in rounds? What's your holding capacity like? Once those steaks are fired and they're at mid-rare and you drop them into your holding box, how long can you hold them there before they up-temp? What, how, how's the accuracy on your holding box? Have you ever dropped a chef alarm in there and, and, and tracked the holding temp, right? So these are all questions that you need to ask yourself um, as a banquet chef or just as a chef in general or just as a home cook, right? When you're trying to execute that meal, you got to think ahead and 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 visualize uh, what you're going to be doing, right? And the better you get at visualizing and planning those steps ahead, the better you'll see uh, those sticking points that are really going to screw you up and, uh, and, and, and get in your way. Now, I think this goes into, uh, into Jordan's question a bit. Let me pull this question over here slightly. So Jordan had a question uh, on menu design. Let's see. So can you guys see that? It might be a little. There we go. 
So many design for small event catering uh, would be a good topic for me, please, especially for 12 people uh, at once. Um, even the CIA Bible, which is massive and apparently complete, doesn't really talk about the specifics of this execution. And for some reason, I just have never had that uh, eureka moment, except when I watch your videos on pickup of dishes. Uh, I've asked the question in Reddit, yada, 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 blah, 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 blah. Um, but they can't understand. They want to be dedicated full-time chef. Um, there are just simply no good resources out there, which breaks us down in 2021 uh, with a high-level courses online uh, and info. Okay. Yeah, so that's the problem with execution in, in general. It's not really discussed um, by chefs or in cookbooks because people think um, that it's, it's boring. Um, and for most people the execution side is boring, but you got to take, you, you got to take your medicine, right? Um, so let's walk through it real quick. Now, without repeating what we've talked about in the last episode and what we've talked about uh, uh, in, in this episode, let me go ahead and just uh, clear that real quick. When I write a menu, besides the whole visualization step, which we just discussed, right, the first thing that I will do once I've finalized that menu is then write a prep list. And it's really as simple as, as going through and reading my menu line by line and item by item and writing down the ingredients. And a lot of times I'll just write it next to it on the menu, and then I'll write like a fully functional prep list. And again, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of these, just a uh, eight and a half by 11 standard uh, printer paper sheet. I fold it in half and I write my list, um, you know, going, going down the line there. Um, and this is for like a novel menu, right? This is for a menu that you don't do every single day, whether it's a, a special banquet uh, menu or a um, tasting menu that you're doing for like a VIP. Uh, in a professional kitchen, you should have like established Excel sheet, uh, style or word document style, but I prefer Excel sheet, uh, prep lists that live on your cook station. So you're not relying on your cooks every single night to hand write a, a prep list. Cause number one, they're going to forget things. Right. And then number two, which is way less efficient. So you give them a sheet. Usually it's a day of the weeks going across the top, uh, items going down the left hand column. And they basically take that sheet and they go, uh, dice carrots, blah, 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 pickled onions. Right. And they check, 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 check all the way down, they basically mark the things that they need to prep for tomorrow. So that way, when they walk in to set up their station, they actually have a prep list that they can look at first thing. So then first thing, when you come in, uh, with when you're working in a professional kitchen, you grab your prep list, you do what we call shopping, which is you grab like a hotel pan or a cart, depending on how much stuff you need and how much space you have on your station. You walk into the walk-in, you the dry storage, you grab a big bulk of everything that you're, you're going to prep. So you don't have to run back and forth between the walk-in and your station constantly, which is going to just waste time. And then you start knocking out your prep stuff, uh, starting your longer items first, obviously. So if you got to braise some things or make some stocks, right, those are the first things that you get going. All right, so same sort of workflow with a novel menu or a menu that you're doing at home, right? Um, but so what you want to do is, is start by actually writing your menu, right? And then after you write your menu, and the verbiage sounds nice, because also, too, uh, when – even if you're just having an informal dinner party, right? Unless you've gotten really good at, at just the general bullshitting of, of you know, that, that, that chefs kind of thrive in, right? The menu helps you kind of uh, organize in your brain uh, the poetry behind your dishes, right? So when somebody asks you about, you know, what are we eating? Your response shouldn't be a five-minute description of everything you did for the dish. It should be, ah, here we have a uh, pan-roasted Muscovy duck breast, with a little bit of a honey ginger glazed carrots and a uh, cherry demi gloss, right? So what that does is just basically puts that poetry of that dish into their brain, and then they can ask for uh, more clarifications if they want. Hey, hey, how'd you do the carrots? Hey, how'd you make the sauce? Right, but it's, it's your uh, discussion starter. So write down your menu course by course, and then you look at you know duck. Well, okay. Am I going to buy the breast? Am I going to break the duck down? Okay, so break down duck, make duck stock, right? Um, you know, pit cherries for sauce, okay? And then carrots, peel carrots, slice carrots, uh, or, I, you know, a lot of times, I mean, you don't have to write down every single step, right? If I see carrots on there, I'll just put prep carrots, right? I know I'm doing glazed carrots, so I'm going to need to get the baby carrots, peel them down, possibly blanch them um, if, I, if I want to, or just set my glaze and greens aside, right? 
and then uh, grab some garnishes, that sort of thing. Okay, and you just work your way down the list. And then what we'll do as far as in a tasting environment, and even I'll do this at home, is you have your mise en place that you preset, and then we'll group it by dish because you don't always have, uh, especially, again, if you're doing uh, like a novel tasting menu, meaning that it's not part of your normal workflow, I don't have a whole lot of empty mise en place space uh, up on the hotline. So when we were doing our, our chef's tasting ca- counter that we called Pip's Pass, um, we were doing this in the middle of a regular dinner service. So we had a full you know restaurant around us, uh, fully functioning uh, dinner service going down. And we were doing a tasting menu for the chef's counter for eight people, and we didn't have a whole lot of extra mise en place place. So what we would do is we would group our mise en place in hotel pans, and then in between each course, we basically pull out that hotel pan uh, for that course, and we would set up the mise en place real quick, and we'd execute that next course. So the same thing at, at home, right, is you want to get all of your ingredients in check, and then you want to do what we call a line check. And this is still universal for the home chef as well, is... Uh, sorry, I just got a comment saying the audio in, uh, in clubhouse wasn't too good. So we'll, we'll work on that later on. All right. So, but you want to do a line check where you basically take your prep list and take your menu and I'll do one final walkthrough with the menu. And I'll basically, again, what am I doing on that final walkthrough? I'm visualizing my what? That's right. My execution. Okay. So I have this menu in hand. I now have my mise en place in front of me. Uh, all uh, you know, grouped together in my hotel pans or however you want to group them. And I say, all right, first course is my butter lettuce salad. Do I have my butter lettuce leaf? Do I have my vinaigrette made? Do I have my pine nuts, my deli container? Do I have my herbs? Do I have my salt? Yes, yes, yes. Check, check, check all the way down. Cool. First course is ready to rock. Second course, I got this, I got that. You know, oh, oh no, I, I forgot to make the sauce for this. I got to go make the sauce real quick, right? Hopefully that's not the thing. And then you just go all the way down and you double check your mise en place. And then as you're thinking about it, or as you're double checking your mise en place, again, you're visualizing that execution. What plate am I going to put this on? Where are my plates? Are they buried in the garage? Are they buried in the basement? Are they buried in storage? Right? Let me go grab those plates. Are the cl- plates clean? Make sure they're clean. Make sure they're stacked. Make sure they're in a place where they're, they're easy to grab and execute. Okay? Again, this is where people always mess up on the execution side is they just they forget to visualize and plan ahead. But what you want to do is really get good at legitimately visualizing that execution in your brain. And, and, and people who watch the live stream, uh, they, they it's funny, they one of the running jokes is they kind of, you know, they watch me cook with my uh, imagination. You can kind of see me close my eyes and visualize and my hands start kind of moving around like I'm in the kitchen cooking right? Because that's how, that's how I've always done it, right? And that's how the successful chefs and cooks I know uh, do it as well, is you actually go in, into your imagination and you imagine yourself cooking each dish step by step by step and how you're executing it, how you're going to be deglazing that pan and where does that pan go and where, you know, uh, once it's deglazed, if you are, are kind of short on time or if you're plating, where are you going to hold that sauce, Right, you're going to hold it over to the left of the stove. Is it too hot by that s- section? Is it going to break? Right, these are all these things that you want to think about. And then, unfortunately, um, you're going to have a lot of failures. Right, that's just kind of a part and parcel of what we do. Um, is you because what's going to happen is, you know, you, you don't know that the dog's going to bite you till the dog bites you. You don't know what you don't know when you're visualizing the execution. So sometimes you will visualize things uh, that you think that you can do and you haven't done them before and you try and do them and it just doesn't work. And the best thing to do is under live fire in that scenario is just be quick to pull the escape hatch, right? Like it's, you got to rely on the fact that um, and be confident in the fact that you're still a great cook. You're still a great chef, right? This thing that you're doing right now isn't working out. So fuck it, just pull the escape hatch, do something else real quick, get something on the plate that looks good, that tastes good, right? And uh, and then sell it to them, right? If you, if it's on a tasting menu and the and the guest is expecting something else, sell it to them differently to say, uh, you know, we had a last minute change on this dish, uh, we decided to go this direction because of this, this, and that, right? And uh, and and also too, sometimes uh, people love to hear that a chef screwed something up. So if you tell them too, hey, uh, you know. We were working on this thing in the back, but that just totally uh, failed. But we got something even better for you. Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, 
X dish here, okay? But also when the stakes are high, right? When you're, you know, cooking a, a, a tasting menu that really matters, right? For high paying clientele or for a super VIP guest or to land that dream job, right? Now is not the time to be working out new executions that you haven't done before. And what you have to realize too is in every sport, in every game, there's something to be said for home court advantage, right? Uh, your kitchen that you're comfortable in is the best home court advantage, right? So if you're going into a new kitchen to do a tryout, you are playing an away game. So you got to take that into consideration. You got to realize that you're not going to know possibly where all their nine pans are. And even if they show you, you might forget because it's a new kitchen, right? You're going to be hunting for a spatula or for a whisk, right? So maybe make sure you have those things in your knife roll ready to go. So working in a new environment is always a bit daunting. It's all, no matter how good you are, it's always going to slow you down a little bit. All right. So when you're playing that away game, you want to go to your A team, which is going to be your A dishes. Those dishes that we talked about before, you know, those 10 to 12 to 14 dishes that you just know dead, right? That as long as you have the ingredients and a heating element, you could nail them. And those are the dishes that you want to be doing on your tryout. Uh, those are the style of dishes that you want to be doing uh, when it really matters. And then save the experimental stuff when the um, the risk factor is uh, is much lower. All right. So I'm just going to take a second here and uh, and review your comments. We are also live uh, in Discord as well, if you want to drop your comment there. Um, people... We got Robert and Fran here hanging out with us in the clubhouse chat. If you guys want to ask a question, go ahead and raise your hand in the clubhouse and I'll uh, see what I can do. Try and call on you. Just uh, take another moment here to kind of read through the comments. And the questions. All right. Well, another podcast episode. Oh, we do have one hand raise. Fran, let's let's see if this works. Um invite to speak. Hello, Fran. You're live on the Cell Corner School podcast. Can you hear me? Awesome. Hi, Chef Jacob. Can you hear me okay? I sure can. Yeah. Welcome to the podcast. How can I help you? Awesome. Thank you. Well, actually, I had a question somewhere in the chat. Uh, I don't know if it went through or if I put it the right way. Uh, but basically, I'm curious about mm, uh, shelf life or actually how long can I store uh, cured meat uh, in the fridge? Because I know that, you know, just regular meat, um, you're supposed to use it, I guess, you know, a few days. Uh, but what I'm going to do tomorrow, or actually what I started doing already is uh, I'm going to make a kielbasa sausage, um, and it's going to be a cured, uh, cured sausage, obviously 2% salt, and I'm going to smoke it to 160-ish, and then I'm going to uh, chill it quickly, you know, the usual progress. And the question is, how long can I actually keep it in the fridge? Um, a few days or is it weeks but what, what i used to do is i would vacuum seal them up and i would put them in um in suey so it would be pasteurized so that way i can just keep it in a fridge for quite a bit of time uh but with this one i'm not going to pasteurize it i'm just going to do it the you know the traditional way and the question is how long can it keep yeah, so with, with something like a, a a cured meat, because you have the curing salt and also the smoke, which is antimicrobial, um, and you're storing it at refrigeration temperatures, it'll keep for quite a bit of time. Um, what you're looking for is basically just the general signs of spoilage. So uh, when it starts to smell bad, when it starts to grow uh, anything funky on the outside that's not white. So even a little bit of white mold is, is natural on uh, long-cured charcuterie items. Um and because you're cooking it first, you're basically going to be killing anything that's that's in there. So uh, a kielbasa with um, you know the proper amount of curing salt, you're probably looking at at least uh, you know three weeks to a month, uh, assuming that it's uh, stored in an airtight container. It doesn't necessarily have to be stored like in a vacuum pack, um, but also mm -hmm. too cured meats doesn't just 
uh, magically go bad without looking like it went bad or smelling like it went bad. So as, as long as you're storing it properly under refrigeration, it should last you a few weeks easily. Perfect. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Fran. I appreciate you chiming in, and thanks for joining us on Clubhouse. Likewise. Thanks. All right. Well, that uh, I think that's going to do it for today. Now, one thing that I will say for my my live audience watching, a little, uh, little inside baseball here. Um, so, first of all, head on over to StellaCorner.com. That's where you can find all of my old legacy content. Oh, it looks like we have Robert here. Robert has a question. What's up, Robert? Uh, one second here. Robert, hello. You're live on the Stella Corner School podcast. Hey, can you hear me okay? Yes, Robert, go ahead. Thanks so much. Hey, I was out a question for you. I'm a, I do a lot of uh, large dinner parties at home. And um, one of the things I was curious about, as you mentioned earlier, when you're doing large banquets about holding temps for keeping, for instance, a filet at mid-rare. Normally what I'll do is I'll um, reverse sear them all. And then just before I'm ready to plate them, I'll just finish them off in, you know, a hot pan, sear them up and then plate them up. I was just wondering if uh, what the temperature was that you're able to hold at mid rare for extended periods of time. Yeah, it depends. Uh, how many people are you, are you talking about? Uh, about 10 people. This okay. Is coming in you know, a couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So and, and I'm sorry, are you doing this uh, sous vide or how are you doing the reverse sear on it? Uh, I was just putting them in a low oven, um, okay. getting them up to camp, and then going from there. Yeah. So what what I would what I would do is so it actually if you've ever get, like waited around for a, a a roast to to cool down, you'll you'll notice that it takes a long time when you hit that internal temperature uh, for it to to drop in temp. So the point being that it takes a while for meat in general to really get cold. The first thing obviously that gets cold is is the exterior. So uh, what you'll want to do is in probably in a, a smaller environment is I would, um, when you have that reverse sear, just kind of let them, after you sear them. So first, when you pull them out of the oven, they're at the right temperature. Obviously, you want to let them uh, the, the exterior cool a little bit so that way you don't up tempo when you sear it. And then on, on the pickup, you hit it with a good hard sear. And then you can normally just let them sit to the side for a few minutes uh, to plate. Now, if you want to actually hold it, I would let the exterior cool off um, a little bit more, um, and then you can pop it back into your oven. And if for a, an extended hold time, assuming that your oven temperature is is true, um, you're, we hold things in hot boxes, like at the mid-rear temperature, right around 150. And that's because a, a, a hot box or your home oven is a dry environment, so the heat transfer is not going to be that efficient. So you have to have, if your steak is, is perfectly mid-rare um, and, and you put it in a 150-degree dry environment, it'll hold mid-rare uh, for, for about 20 to 30 minutes, uh, give or take, again, depending upon the overall accuracy um, of that, that actual temperature. If you're in a, um, uh, an environment where you have like a combi oven, uh, which we've discussed before, then you can hold uh, right at like the, the core temperature that you want. Uh, with a little bit of steam, so you use like thirty percent steam, thirty five percent steam, you know, at that one thirty two Fahrenheit, and uh, and but also too, a lot of times what I do is again because it takes so long for that core temperature to actually drop, and I'm working in smaller batches if I'm at home. So if you're doing this for, for ten people, a lot of the time, assuming that you have the the oven space, you can take um, the you just uh, pull your oven up to you know four fifty five hundred. And then, uh, you know, have your, your seared steaks that are, are, are finished, uh, you know, that have been resting on your counter for maybe 15, 20 minutes while you're getting the rest of the meal ready to go. Just flash them in the oven for uh, 60 to 90 seconds until when you touch them with the back of your hand, the exterior feels hot. And then when people slice into it, the, the core is still going to be warm. The exterior is hot. Uh, it's going to be served with other hot sides and possibly a hot sauce. So it's going to give them the perception that they're uh, eating a hot steak, which which they are. And that's my favorite way to execute, um, you know, 10 to 12 steaks in a smaller environment. Does that answer your question? 
Yeah, absolutely. That was very helpful. Uh, I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, Robert. I appreciate you uh, listening to us in the, the clubhouse and uh, jumping on in. It looks like we have a couple more questions here um, to go through. So Dave asks, uh, talk a little bit more about the Japanese technique called Yukoni. Um, I am not familiar with that technique, so we'll have to do a, a Google search on that and uh, maybe do an update. Maybe we'll all le- be learning a new technique along with y'all. Uh, Jordan wants an Anova combi of an update. Uh, I promised it last week. Yes, I did. Okay, cool. So, uh, quick Anova combi of an update. Um, so I had two more ovens come, right? Because I took my oven to work. So I ordered two more, one as a second oven for work and one, um, to replace my oven at home. Um, so quick thing, if you're, if you're getting a combi oven and, and you're new, uh, first of all, make sure that you shame Anova um, on Instagram or Twitter, but preferably Instagram, uh, by tagging me and saying, uh, Chef Jacob, I bought it because of you, uh, and then uh, tag the uh, um, the Anova Food Nerd tag, um, just because it's 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 fun, right? I normally in in a normal situation, um, I would have signed up for if I was just a, like a normal podcaster that was all about my business, right? I would have signed up for a um, an affiliate link and gotten a kickback on every single $600 oven that I've sold, which uh, at this point has been um, quite a few. Um, but also too, I, I think it would make my, my talk about it less authentic, not for me personally, but I think your perception as, uh, as the audience, right? If, if every single time I talk about the Innova oven, I'm then sending you to my affiliate link that gives me a kickback. Um, then, you, you know, I just don't think that what I say carries as, as much uh, value. Right, so really, what a Nova should be doing is they should just be sending me checks out of goodwill. So, and we're gonna we're gonna just shame them by 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 cross posting on Instagram and Facebook and everywhere else, and uh, make sure you let them know that I'm the one who who sent you. So, outside of that, Lucy, the uh, the the Nova oven that we have on the saute side of our restaurant uh, that we use for holding uh, eggs has been performing grandly. We are very happy with uh, Lucy's performance, and she's been making a, a great addition uh, to the culinary team. And uh, let's see, outside of that, I've been super busy, so I haven't had a whole lot of um, of new interactions. Although I will say, so when the second oven came, right, because I went through, I did I did the first, uh, the first burn-off process, um, with my my first oven where I did I went through and did everything manually, right? Then the second oven came and I thought to myself, well, I can just do this this burn off process by uh, by programming it into the app like I've done with my, my other cooks. So because it's a, it's a two step heating process where you have to heat one element for like fifteen minutes and let it cool and heat another element for fifteen minutes. So the first thing I did is I took it out of the box, I plugged everything in, and I can I downloaded the app on my phone and I connected to to the Wi Fi. I set the Wi Fi on the oven up. And I was just going to go in and program my um, my oven at the temperatures and times that it that I said. It's one of my favorite features of uh, of the Innova Combi oven is having that app for programming. Uh, when I fired up the app, it said, uh, "Hey, we noticed that this is the first time you're doing the oven. Uh, we recommend a, a burn off process or something like that. Uh, would you like to start it now?" And they had a start button. I pressed start, and it's just fired right up. It was awesome. It was great. So. Um, if you are, so that's a little pro level tip for you. Cause at this point I've set up three of these things. And, uh, so when you unbox it, the first thing you want to do after you plug it in, uh, and, and assemble all the parts, which is really easy, just like the water tank and that sort of thing is, um, you know, just fire up the app, download the app, connect it to, uh, to Wi-Fi, uh, and then go from there. And also too, I did notice that they updated their app, um, in the, um, uh, on, on the phone itself to have more quick user start guides. So now if you want to do like an air fry or um, like a sous vide roast or something like that, uh, they just have buttons like at the top of the app that just basically set your oven to uh, what they recommend for that setting, uh, which is uh, really nice um, when you're first getting into it, right? Like, so even me, right, who I, you know, I have a, a whole memory bank in my head of times and temps and the ways that I like to execute uh, different foods, uh, you know, from the the pre- professional side of my life, but being able to see, okay, so what what is their version of air fry? So when I want to set up my combi oven to air fry, what is it, right? And then I hit the the air fry setting 
for uh, for preheat and it shows me their exact settings. So then if I want to replicate it or maybe I, I go in and I say, well, you know, their air fry worked out good, but I really wish I had some more heat from this top element to get some more browning or I think that uh, the air fryer maybe was a little bit too robust, so I'm going to pull back a little, 20, you know, 25 degrees. It's a really good starting point, right? Because they're the ones that have manufactured the oven and tested the oven. So at least you have a, a starting point. You're not starting from complete scratch. And then with a, within a couple of cooks, uh, you can write your own program, which is basically just telling the oven, hey, I want you to start at this temperature, stop at this temperature, transition to this temperature, right? And, um, and get some, some really good results. Um. All right, so Dave dropped a link into the chat uh, on the Yukoni or Yukon. I'm probably butchering that. It's my, my first time actually seeing that. Um, so I'll review that uh, later this week or possibly this weekend, um, and we'll get going. So also, too, now if you guys check this out, um, I actually saw in the in the Facebook group I posted a, uh, not to get too, too geeky and in the weeds, kind of inside baseball, but I posted a picture of my new studio setup, which I'm I'm pretty uh, stoked on. I'm just I'm starting to take back some of that crochet room, right? My my my, my wife engulfed my my home office with her crochet stuff, and we're uh, we're we've created a, a demilitarized zone where I basically have a little bit more space to get some stuff done. Um, and she's been very nice helping me. But um, one of the things that um, I did is I got this live uh, camera switcher, which is going to allow for multi camera shoots. Uh, which I can easily transfer into my kitchen for some live stuff uh, eventually. But what I'm really stoked on is you can switch to, um, let me see, this camera here, which is um, a little bit more uh, more clear. So I've been showing you, we've been doing this whole podcast on the DSLR, which looks more more artsy, right? But imagine this camera here, up a little bit more, zoomed out a little bit more, and a, a big old uh, whiteboard behind me, right? So this way, in the uh, in the actual uh, lectures, or actually in, in when you guys ask questions or when there's specific topics that we want to cover, I know how much you guys love my doodles during the whole uh, F-Step lecture series, right? So this will be a way for us to, to bring them back and, uh, and to do some really fun, intensive learning. Also, too, because I have a multiple screen set up in front of me, uh, I can have uh, various graphics that I build within the within Keynote, uh, which is you know the Max version of the PowerPoint, and so we can also use that as uh, for visuals and for learning tools as well. Uh, but I was just happy to see that I was able to go live and stream live with a new setup. Um, I've been working uh, for the last week to get this stuff going. Uh, things stabilized enough at uh, at work the other day um, that I was actually able to take a personal day yesterday. Uh, which was nice. Um, you know, I was just like, hey, uh, you know, talk to the GM. GM's you know, awesome, awesome. That's a person. That's you know, her and 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 the ownership is the reason why I, I work at this hotel. Um, but anyways, I say, hey, you, you mind if I take a personal day? Everything is covered. She's like, yeah, of course, yeah, get out of here. So I actually I spent uh, the better part of yesterday putting the finishing touches. I still got um, Amazon boxes and B and H photo boxes strewn about the house and and uh, all crazy. Uh, but. I've been having a ton of fun uh, doing these live podcasts for you, and I think as you know, using this as our as our base, as our way to connect with each other, um, and then reincorporating the the technique videos, reincorporating uh, various segments of the podcast and other formats, is going to really give us a robust learning environment, right? That's going to really bring everybody's knowledge uh, who tunes in. Uh, to that next level. So I appreciate everybody who tunes into these things live. Um, playing off of you uh, is a lot of fun, but also too, it helps to keep me focused on on what it is that the community is want, wanting to know and wanting to learn about and, um, and, and traveling down this path together. It's um, really reinvigorated me and given me a ton of energy. So I'm looking forward to what's to come. We're just going to continue to keep on uh, polishing uh, off uh, the rough edges and and uh, just keep on growing, keep on growing and keep on doing our thing, right? It's kind of like how I launch restaurants, right? We were talking about in a previous uh, episode. You go in, uh, you know, you get a, a a a good menu, a solid menu that you can execute well, and then you grow it, right? And you continue to grow it. Same thing with this podcast, right? We started off with just a a simple webcam and a microphone. Uh, streaming live to the uh, the Excel Culinary School Facebook group, and uh, now it's growing into something bigger and badder. 
Now, for those of you who love the uh, the YouTube technique videos I do over on my main channel, those are coming back as well. Uh, I have videos in the works. I've had them in the works. But right now, getting this set up, finalized, is really going to be the priority uh, because as we go through the kind of the workflow for this whole uh, teaching side is we we discuss the broader ideas in larger detail in a conversational tone, uh, answering your questions as they come in within the live podcast. Then those live podcasts, they get uh, busted up into segments that then you can rewatch. So if you want to dive into the details of like how you execute a banquet, you can have that as a, as a segment, right? And then specific techniques that we discuss about then become technique videos within YouTube. Um, and then we can cross link everything and use them as a uh, great learning environment, all to reinforce um, the the fundamentals that we teach and talk about on a daily basis. Speaking of which, if you are into the fundamentals and you want to uh, uh, learn more about how I teach people, uh, you know how to cook, whether you're a professional or a home cook, uh, check out my co- my Stella Culinary uh, Boot Camp, right, in the F-Step curriculum. You can find that by going to stellaculinary.com slash boot camp. And it is uh, eight and a half hours of live lectures uh, from a boot camp I did in the past, plus my uh, written curriculum, which is 132 pages of uh, just knock your socks off sort of content. It is the fastest way to learn how to cook uh, like a professional chef and really to go from creating or from following recipes to creating your own recipes, right? It gives you the fundamental building blocks that you need to understand to pick apart a recipe and to create a, a great recipe. Also to sign up for the email newsletter, uh, if you haven't already, um, because I really don't do much with it except let you know when new content's coming out, right? So um, if you head on over to sellercorner.com, you'll see a little link at the top to sign up for the newsletter. Uh, go ahead and sign up there. And uh, when I release a new video or release a new podcast, I'll send you an email uh, letting you know that it's uh, live and ready to go. And then also, if you listen to this on audio, make sure you subscribe into the podcast via your favorite audio app uh, and uh, leave me a review. That's it. I hope everyone had a uh, fantastic week. Thank you so much for listening to us either on the replay or for joining us live. And... I will uh, see you all next week. Same bat time, same bat place, 7 a.m. Eastern or 7 a.m. Pacific, uh, 10 a.m. Eastern, uh, right here in the Stella Culinary School Facebook group. And the replay will be live later today on your favorite podcasting app or at youtube.com slash Stella Culinary Live. That's our new uh, YouTube address, right? for the live podcast. Now, if you want my technique videos, you go to uh, youtube.com slash Jacob Burton right? If you want the uh, live podcast feed and what will also host the additional segments coming up, right? So when I take these larger podcasts and break them into segments, you go to uh, youtube.com slash Stella Culinary Live, and that'll get you where you're wanting to go. All right. Thanks everyone for uh, joining in. I hope everyone has a great weekend, cook something delicious, and I will see you all next week.